I just want to introduce my friend, my doctor, my, um, we know each other for over 35 years. <laughs> and I, I like to introduce Dr. Brown. He is one of the PIs at, for the study to help the AIDS research effort, which is the SHARE research program. I'm also a part, I'm part of the CAB membership whenever I don't have a conflict in another meeting. <laughs> but Dr. Brown, um, as you can see, he's the, um, part of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Meta Metabolism. Metabolism. And, and, and you can see more of Dr. Brown's uh, bio. If you, again, scan the QR code on your desk or your tables, you will see all the uh, bios of our amazing speakers. So thank you. Okay. With that being said, Dr. Brown, you can come on up. Give him a round of applause. Yes. And trust me, if I'm ever in the hospital at Hawkins, he do come visit me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Carlton, and thanks so much for inviting me to speak to you today. So I'm an endocrinologist, as Carlton said, so I treat uh, people for their diabetes and osteoporosis and low testosterone. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Larry. Uh, low testosterone and, um, and cholesterol problems and all kinds of uh, metabolic problems. Um, and for about the last 20 plus years, I've been interested in these um, diabetes and all these other endocrine problems in people with HIV. Um, and so um, on the research side and also on, on the clinical side. And so my career is sort of, as, as things have evolved, my career has been focused on aging and what it means to age uh, and what it means to age with HIV. And so uh, I am going to, so here are my disclosures. So I'm gonna start off with a few words about aging. Um, and so what you see here is um, a, uh, a, a graph or what's going to be a graph where you have age on the bottom axis and quality of life for physical and cognitive function. And so the ideal life you would think is to maximize lifespan, so maximize your time on the planet, but also maximize the quality of life that you have, okay? So this is sort of what I picture to be my ideal life, where it's totally maximized in terms of, of the quality of life uh, up until about age 103, where after spending the day with family and, and friends, walking in the woods maybe, I die in my sleep. Okay, so there is what, it, what is the ideal life. But this is probably what's gonna happen. Um, in, and we have, uh, you know, our quality of life is, is high and then it declines over time. Um, and so why is that? You know, why does, it, why does it happen? Why do we get this decline in our physical and cognitive function over time? Um, so why do we age? And so we can answer this question um, from a lot of perspectives. You know, so you can answer it from a biochemical perspective. What's going on in this at the level of the cell? You can answer it on a societal level and everything in between uh, on a philosophical level. Um, so um, it's useful to think about aging in two ways. One is chronologic age, which we know, right? So this is the number of years that we have existed on the planet. And then there's this issue of biologic age, okay? Biologic age being the wear and tear on our organs or the age that we look and feel. So we all know people who are 65 years old who look like they're 55 or even 50. And then we all know people who are 65 and who look like they're 75 or 80. And so wh what's going on here? And so we can think about um, this in terms of a car. So these cars were built in the same year. Okay, so you can see that the car on the left is, um, is sort of shiny and new. So its biologic age is pretty new, whereas the car on the right, not so much. And by a show of hands, if you were a car, which car would you want to be? Car on the left or car on the right? Yes, yeah, so not too many people want to be in the car on the right. And so 
the important thing is really to try to bring down that biologic age, to try to, to, try to make it even at your chronologic age or even earlier than your chronologic age, ideally. And so, and then this is an important, the important corollary of this is that the chrono your chronologic age is not necessarily equal to your biologic age. Okay, so why do we age? So there are some factors that we know about, right? So the passage of time, obviously that's sort of by definition why we age, but there are a bunch of other things that, that contribute to the whole aging process. And one of them, and, and, and Dr. Agbu talked a lot about this, is other diseases that people have. So things like diabetes and things like heart disease, things like osteoporosis, and the list goes on. Behaviors are really important. And so smoking, for example, or heavy alcohol use or physical activity, those contribute to the aging process. The genes, and so we can't do much about the genes, but uh, they do indeed contribute. And then life stressors, as, as, uh, as Allison was talking about, with stigma and other factors that may contribute to the aging process. So as to, to make this example a little more uh, uh, clear and accessible, um, I, I like to show this picture of this guy named John Turner who's a weightlifter and a psychiatrist, actually. And so there he is, good looking body, right? And so here's, here's the test. How old is he? Is he 33? Is he 43? Is he 53? Is he 63? That's right. He's 63. Yeah. yeah, so pretty impressive, right? So this is someone who, who uh, clearly uh, his biologic age is less than, than his, his chronologic age. Okay, so let's just switch gears and talk a little, with that context, switch gears and talk a little bit about, about, or talk about HIV. And so I'm sure Allison showed you something similar to this. These are survival, this is a survival curve. This happens to be in Denmark. And so what this shows is that um, here is age on this axis and um, survival on the, the y-axis. So what this means is that it, at a, and everyone starts up here at 100%, so everyone's living at the top of the study, right? And then over time, um, people die, okay? And so what this shows is the population controls in green are the people in Denmark, um, and you can see that over time, pe some people die, okay? And so what the other lines are, the black, the blue, and the red, what this shows is the survival in, in groups of people with HIV based on the, the year, okay? Um, and what this shows is that is over the course of the year, so you had the, er, the pre-ART period, pre-antiretroviral therapy, early antiretroviral therapy, and then current antiretroviral therapy. And with each of these lines, this median survival, which means the 50% survival, is uh, that increases. Um, but what's important, and I don't know if I have a, um, it, what's important is that the red curve is not quite where the, 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 or the green curve is. It's getting there, and if uh, you did another iteration, this is, these are sort of old data, 2016, but it would even be closer than to the population controls. So, but there still is a gap between people with HIV and their survival and people without HIV. And uh, with this improved survival, as we know, and this is sort of the, uh, the whole, the whole uh, focus of this conference, is, the, is the, how the, the graying of the population. And so we see this around the world. This happens to be in the Netherlands. What this shows is the percentage of people uh, uh, here on the, the, the vertical axis, the year on the horizontal axis, 2010, uh, the first year, and then projecting out to 2030. And what you see in, the, in the, uh, the top three colors are the proportion of people who are 50 and older, and in that yellow band is 70 and older. And so what you see in 2010, the proportion is about 30% in, uh, in the Netherlands, but increases to seven, or will increase to 70% by 2030. And so you can do these curves, you know, this, is, this happens to be in the Netherlands, but you can do these curves in the US, you can do them in Italy, you can do them in Africa, and you see sort of the similar trend. Of course, because people are surviving with HIV. And it, really important is that yellow curve there, which is a really small sliver of the population that's 70 and older, but, but it's gonna be 10% uh, of the population uh, in 2030. So very, we'll see the same thing in the US. So along with this survival gap, what we've noticed um, is that there's also a gap in, in other aspects like, like physical function. 
Um, and so this, these are data from, uh, Carlton mentioned the MAC study, the multi-center edge cohort study, which has been going on for 40 years. It, uh, we are, we're one of the sites in, in Baltimore called SHARE, as Carlton mentioned. And it's in Pittsburgh and Los Angeles uh, and, uh, and Chicago as well. And we have a sister cohort called the WISE in nine other sites. Um, now we're a one combined cohort. But what we've been, because we have, we, it's a study of men who have sex with men, about half HIV positive, about half with, uh, living without HIV, and um, we follow the people over time. You know, and Allison mentioned these longitudinal cohort studies. And it turns out we can really understand well what, what's happening to people living with HIV in comparison to people without HIV. Um, who are otherwise similar. And one of the things we've been doing since like the mid 2000s is some of these tests of physical function. And so uh, two common tests of physical function are gait speed, so how far fast you walk on your normal usual pace for just for four meters on the floor. And then um, the other test is grip strength. So you, you squeeze this little machine and it tells you how strong your grip is. Okay, and so what these two curves are showing is the gait speed on the left, the grip strength on the on the right, in by uh, by HIV serostatus. And what you see is that in the blue is the the people living without HIV. And so you can see that in both the blue and the red, people with and without HIV, there's a decrease in in walk speed. There's a decrease in grip strength over this over the the age, which is in the the bottom axis. But what you, what's important is that you see that the, the red line, the people with HIV, uh, are different than the people without HIV. They actually have lower gait speed, lower grip strength, and they're declining at a rapid, more rapid rate. Okay? So what this means is that there's, there's this physical function gap, you know, but the gap between the blue and the red that you're seeing uh, in our cohort. And these data have been seen similarly from other cohorts around the world. You can also think of this physical function gap by something called frailty. So we all, you know, frailty is a word that we all use, and it's sort of like you know it when you see it, you know, who's frail, who's not frail. But this is a definition that, that a lot of people use, and it's, so it's five different things. So it's weight loss, weakness measured by the grip strength, exhaustion, so feeling tired, slowness as me measured by the, the walk speed, and physical inactivity. And what you see over uh, on the, the graph on the right, so same idea as actually the first thing I showed you with some performance on the, on the vertical axis and time on the, on the x-axis, is that you get this decrease with, with normal aging in, in performance, in this case, um, functional performance. But there is a, a subgroup of people who actually um, age more quickly. So they, um, and they uh, have a decrease in performance and they, uh, and they drop and, uh, and get into this frail state before going into disability. So what's really important is to try to figure out, okay, who's gonna be normal aging and who's gonna have accelerated aging and try to intervene on that so that we can bend that curve upwards. So what about frailty in our cohort, uh, in the multi-center AIDS cohort study? And so uh, what we did was uh, we, we looked at this, this frailty measurement and we looked at, at uh, people uh, in various uh, age groups and the, the black diamonds here are the, the men with HIV, the open squares are the men without HIV, and if the, um, you can see that in the 40s, in the, 40s the black and, uh, uh, diamond and the uh, open uh, square are about the same height, but you can see that the, it's higher in the men with HIV, so the black diamonds, pretty much after age 50. So that means that the men with HIV have a higher burden of frailty compared to the men without HIV. The other thing that we, we've noticed in, in our study and many studies around the world is that the people with HIV have a higher burden of these comorbid diseases. And this is what uh, Dr. Aggie, Aggie was talking about. This study comes from the Netherlands. And you can see all these various uh, uh, conditions and diseases, uh, hypertension and heart attack and, uh, and diabetes and lung disease in comparing the prevalence in people with and without HIV. Uh, the, the, um, the 
red is people uh, with HIV, blue is people without HIV, and you can see pretty much in every case the red bar is higher than the blue bar. So there's a higher comorbidity burden uh, in people with HIV. And if you add up these comorbidities, um, so what this is doing is this saying, okay, well, counting the comorbidities, you know, zero, one, two, three, three being in red, two in, in orange, one in yellow, um, and this is by age and by serostatus. And what you see is that if you look at the red, which is the highest burden of comorbidities, it's high, it's, there's more red on the people with HIV versus the people without HIV, and more red with increasing age. So this is the overall, the comorbidity burden is higher. So I'm gonna talk about sort of the causes first, and then I'm gonna talk about what we can do about it, okay? Um, so, as, as uh, Dr. Agu alluded to, it's, it's been a complicated interaction between factors related to the patient, factors related to HIV disease itself, and factors related to medication. Um, and trying to tease these apart have been, has been really challenging. So let's talk about patient factors, and it's important to, to tease these apart into modifiable and non-modifiable. So mo non-modifiable things you can't change, modifiable things you can't change. And so things you can't change, well, you can't change. So you can't change your age or, or your sex or your genes, though you might want to, uh, but you can't do that. So but modifiable are the things you can change, but that's important because you can change them, right? So this is um, weight and smoking and alcohol use and exercise and adherence to antiretroviral therapy and diet, for example. And those actually have a, a big uh, effect on, on some of these processes as we'll talk about. The HIV medications, this has been an enduring story for the last 25 plus years, almost 30 years, thinking about different medications and their, their various side effects. And so I list a few things. So um, we all know about, about tenofovir, old tenofovir, you know, there are two forms of tenofovir. So old tenofovir had problems with uh, the bone and kidney disease. This is still the tenofovir that's used the most actually around the world. Uh, protease inhibitors, particularly early protease inhibitors, were associated with cholesterol problems and specifically diabetes. Now we we're have this, this era where integrase inhibitors, which are most commonly used to treat HIV, are associated with weight gain. And then we have uh, uh, what we call legacy effects. So these are um, effects of medications that persist even though people have been off them for years. So the, the biggest, the most common example is stavudine or Xeret where people um, may not have been on, it may have stopped them 20 years ago, but the effects on fat, the effects on metabolic problems persist. Um, so, they, uh, so this persistence is the legacy effect. The other part, and, I, and, and uh, I'm uh, uh, following up on what Dr. Aggie was talking about, is related to inflammation. So we know what happens with, in, in HIV, this is one of these disease factors, that levels of inflammation in your blood are high, and then when you start on antiretroviral therapy, they come down, but don't come down to the level of normal. And it's good to think about inflammation in terms of like, what is inflammation? You know, what, what's the, the, the example I like to give is a splinter, okay? So if you have, if you get a splinter in your finger, you have this foreign body in your finger. And what happens? Well, it, you get an immune response to that splinter in your finger. You have uh, uh, white blood cells that move in to say, oh, there's this foreign thing in my finger. I got I to gotta fight, make sure I don't get the, 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 my, my human doesn't get infected from it. And um, so you get swelling in the finger, you get redness in the finger, you get pain in the finger, uh, and all that is an immune response and all that is inflammation. And so what's happening in the, the finger happens in, uh, elsewhere in the body. So in the, in the arteries, in the brain, in the liver, so that's what inflammation is all about. So where does this inflammation come from in people with HIV? And there are generally three sources. Um, one of them is um, from the persistence of HIV. So we know that HIV is a tricky virus. It hides out in places that, that it can be protected from the immune system. And in those protected spaces, it can start to replicate. Um, and, it, and it develops, you can develop an immune response, even though the, the level in the blood is completely undetectable. The second is microbial translocation. This is otherwise known as the leaky gut. 
And so what happens is that, you know, when we, when we eat something, you know, there's a barrier and the food goes through, there's a barrier between where the food is and, and where the body is, this barrier, this gut uh, barrier. And that gut barrier can become leaky. And so you get, you get bacterial products that can go across the gut and cause an immune response. Um, so that's another big source. This is important because very early on in, in HIV infection, like in the first couple weeks, you get depletion of the CD4 cells, of the immune cells, in the gut. Uh, and that, that plays an, an important role in this inflammation process. The other, the last thing is related to co-infection. Um, and so one of the common co-infections that we see is hepatitis C. Um, and so um, the good news about hepatitis C is that it's something that we can cure now, you know, with an eight-week course. So that's great. We can decrease inflammation by curing hepatitis C. There are other co-infections. There's something called CMV, cytomegalovirus, that uh, also can lead to immune response and is also common in people with HIV. So um, let's, the, the, the important thing about inflammation is that that's not only a driver of comorbid diseases in people with HIV, but it's also a driver of comorbid diseases related to aging. And all these diseases that you see on the right, those are aging-related diseases. And one of the major mechanisms why these increase with age is also inflammation. So with HIV, you get this double whammy. You get not only an HIV and aging, so as people age with, with HIV, you not only are getting the effects of aging, but you're getting the effects of HIV as well, even when it's under good control. Okay, so one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is, is this idea of um, the population that we're studying, long-term survivors, because the, the issue is, is um, that, that many people uh, in this category, people aging with HIV, who've been, had HIV since the 80s, for example, have, uh, it, it took a while for good antiretroviral therapy to come along. So there was a period where P HIV was not well controlled just because there wasn't good therapy around. The initial, and people started antiretroviral therapy with a lower CD4 cell count, okay? And um, the other thing is that the medications that we had initially, they were good HIV medications. They made the virus undetectable, but they also had side effects. Uh, and so um, one of the issues is, is how much are we seeing now with all these comorbidities and with, with uh, um, what we're seeing with aging, for example, is related to the older treatments and starting CD, uh, HIV medications at a lower CD4 cell count and uh, having a long period of uncontrolled HIV. And so the other way of asking this is, do older people living with HIV have not been exposed to these older, more toxic antiretroviral therapies who started on medications at a higher CD4 cell count, do they also have a risk of these aging-related comorbidities? And that's something that we just don't know at this point. Um, and so it's, it's useful to think of it concretely in this like tale of two patients here. So both, both patient A, patient B, same demographics, same uh, uh, treatment, current treatment with a single pill regimen, same CD4 cell count, same viral load, uh, but the person on the patient A has uh, been in, uh, had HIV since 87, low nadir CD4 cell count, started antiretroviral therapy um, when AZT became available in the 90s and then started any uh, combination antiretroviral therapy uh, in the mid 90s, lots, on, lots of previous regimens that have lots of toxicities associated with them. And compare that to patient B who um, was diagnosed in uh, 2014, started antiretroviral therapy right away, CD4 cell count didn't get all that low. Uh, so uh, is, this, is patient a, B's comorbidity burden the same as patient A's? So that's something that, that we just don't know at this point. And so uh, this is the, the plug. Uh, and so we are recruiting for SHARE. Uh, so this is the study to help the AIDS research effort. This is the study that I mentioned, the Baltimore site of the multicenter AIDS cohort study. Uh, and so both people with and without HIV um, our study, our center is, is uh, men who have sex with men. 
Uh, in DC, our sister site at, at Georgetown is, is recruit, recruiting women. Um, and um, so for the people with HIV that we're recruiting, we're recruiting people who, um, who started antiretroviral therapy after 2007 uh, or so. So to try to get that, to try to get that, that population who, does, who don't have, who weren't exposed to these very toxic antiretroviral therapies, who started antiretroviral therapy at a higher CD4 cell count, et cetera. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. Okay. Uh, so um, now that now we say, okay, well, what can we do about it? Higher burden of, of physical function problems, higher burden of comorbidities. What can we do? And this is how to maximize health span and lifespan. So to optimize uh, healthy lifestyle is really key. I think uh, Allison mentioned this as well. Stopping smoking, excessive drinking, drugging, work, work to lose weight if you're overweight. And it's not a ton of weight that people need to lose. It's really like five to 10% of body weight where you really start to see the metabolic benefit. So that's a really important thing that I, I tell patients all the time in clinic. Uh, increasing physical activity, uh, improving diet. I put here, avoid food in cans and boxes if possible. So this is where there's a lot of preservatives that have a lot of salt in them. Um, also important is, is and uh, Allison also mentioned this, getting screened and getting treated for various problems. And so I'll, I'll tell you why uh, that is. And I'll, I'll first tell you about the screening um, that people should get. It's a lot. It's a lot of different types of screening that people should get for their diabetes, for their cholesterol, for blood pressure, kidney disease, osteoporosis, anal cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, cancer colon cancer, et cetera. And so it's a lot going on, but it's also uh, really important. Um, and I'll tell you why, because this is what I showed you before with the, 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 the decline in physical and cognitive function and quality of life. And I'm, I'm showing this as sort of a smooth curve, like you get this decline over time, like nice and slow. But in reality, this decline may not be gradual. It may be, uh, um, these, event, these decreases may be precipitated or caused by some sort of event. So look at this person. They're going along fine till about age 50 and they have a heart attack. And their function decreases, but it doesn't come back to where it was before. And something else happens to them. So they get heart failure. And, uh, and then their function drops again. And they get a, have an admission for hip fracture. And their function drops again. And then they have a stroke. And by the end, you're, you're, then they're, they're down into the disability range. So the real key thing is trying to prevent these comorbidities, from ha these events from happening by controlling these comorbid diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cholesterol and blood pressure, et cetera. And so to prevent these, Really good screening tests are available. Uh, so, so one of the ones that I showed you, there are a lot of behavioral factors that contribute. So if we're talking about diabetes, so diet and exercise and weight are really key. Uh, uh, if you have diabetes, adherence to diabetes medications is key. Early treatment is really important. And good treatments exist that can decrease the risk of these events. So decreasing the risk of heart attacks. And Allison showed you the, the reprieve results. So we know that by, by giving the statin medication, you can decrease the risk of heart attack and stroke uh, in people with HIV. Uh, fracture is the same thing. We can decrease the risk of fracture. If we identify someone with osteoporosis, we can give, them, give people medication, give, uh, talk about f decreasing fall risk, and that will decrease their risk of having a fracture. And so preventing complications can alter this aging process. And so I see these comorbidities and screening for them more in the larger context of trying to prevent aging in general. So we all know about the HIV treatment cascade, super important, right? So we want to identify everyone who has HIV if we can, get them linked to care, get them onto treatment, get their viral load undetectable, uh, and, and so the, the community viral load decreases, transmission decreases. And there are gaps in each of these steps along the way, and trying to understand what the, the problems are, why there are these gaps, is really critical to trying to, to improve this cascade. So we also have the same thing for every comorbidity we're talking about. And so I put some, this is just fictional data here, and you know, I deal a lot with bones. And so thinking about people and their fracture risk, you can identify a group of people at high fracture risk, and then you can prescribe medication to those people who, 
who uh, qualify for it or eligible for it. Uh, you can talk about adherence to these specific uh, treatments for bone. And by doing so, you can decrease the risk of fracture in a population. And similarly for diabetes, for example, you know, lots of people don't know they have diabetes, but you can, you can identify people with diabetes, get their uh, sugars controlled well, get them on optimal medications, et cetera. So uh, I'll end with talking about inflammation a little bit so, and what to do about it. So I won't go into this slide, but there's been thinking about it, that inflammation is the major driver of comorbidities. There's been lots of studies in people with HIV trying to target these, this inflammation, giving, giving medications that, that uh, focus on one aspect or another of, of inflammation. None of them actually have worked very well, even though there's been a lot of uh, research about it. We're still trying, but there's a lot of things that people can do right now that will decrease their inflammatory burden. One of them is, uh, the obvious one, is to stay on antiretroviral medications. Um, so it's to stay undetectable. Smoking, weight, uh, overweight, losing, again, five to 10% of body weight. Uh, exercise, having a healthy diet, cutting down on alcohol, and avoiding drugs, getting hepatitis C cured, maintaining dental health. All those are really critical in decreasing the infl inflammation burden. So when you think about it, I showed this before, this sort of curve going down, when you think about, well, when is the best time to intervene? Basically, we're, we can intervene at two places. One is, is before things happen, which is called primary prevention, so preventing things before they happen. And then secondary prevention uh, is important, but probably if, it's, if the, the, the intervention is low cost and low toxicity, that's probably the better way to go. To, uh, to, to prevent this decline. And uh, I, I want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, talk about the whole patient. So I've been focusing more on sort of the comorbidity, the biomedical side of things, but there's a whole other part of this regarding psychosocial aspects, educational aspects, as existential aspects that are really important. And I think Allison touched on some of those. So here are the, some of the key questions, and then I'll finish. Are the mechanisms underlying aging the same or different in people living with HIV compared to the general population? How much is this accelerated functional decline in older people living with HIV relate to unique factors in the first wave of this population, things that we talked about before? How can we use the implementation science? So this is like tr doing what we already know works and trying to make sure that these things are implemented in people w living with HIV for this comorbidity cascade. And what are the best ways to management strategies to optimize healthy aging? So those are some of the things that the, the big questions uh, in the field now. And so I, I show this to you again, and I would say that by, by, by doing what we can for inflammation, by finding comorbidities and treating them, uh, we can bend this curve upwards and improve aging in people living with HIV. So I'll end there and happy to take any questions. So, yeah, so the question was about hormone therapy, and it's for men or women or both? Actually, yeah. I have it both. Yeah, 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 so great question. Um, yeah, so, the, um, so this is hormone therapy, so this is testosterone in men and estrogen in women. Um, and so, oh, and transgender people. Okay, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll take each of those because they're all a little bit different. So for, um, we know that the burden of, of, of men, um, testosterone is generally low in people with HIV, and the prevalence of having a low testosterone is higher in men with HIV compared to not. And in our cohort, for example, about 25% of the men with HIV older, over 60 were on, are on testosterone, as opposed to about 4% of the men without HIV, and it, compared to about 2% of the general population of that same age. So testosterone use is really uh, high. The question, there's a lot of question now about testosterone use and the long-term benefits and the long-term risks as people get older. 
One of the big things was about car uh, cardiovascular disease, where people having on testosterone having more heart attacks. And a study was published actually last year showing in the general population at least that there wasn't an increased risk of heart attacks um, with men on testosterone versus not. This is in the general population. And so, but there are a lot of things that we don't know about testosterone. And you know, it's, it's a question, it's something that I talk with patients all the time on testosterone. Should I be on this? Should I not be on this? What's the benefits? What's the risk? So that's on the, on the male side. On the female side, with hormone replacement, we know that it is, the, we know that menopause is earlier in women with HIV. Um, there's some data to suggest that the menopausal symptoms are worse in women with HIV compared to not. Uh, so and the best treatment for hormonal symptoms, so these hot flashes and, and these kinds of symptoms, is estrogen. So we know that, that, uh, that this medication, so giving estrogen back is effective, but we also know that there's some risks associated with it. And so back 15 years ago, um, pe the pendulum was totally the other way. There was a big study in the general population showing that, that, that uh, hormone replacement therapy in women increased the risk of heart attack, increased the risk of breast cancer, and so no one was prescribing it. Now it's moved a little bit in the other direction um, to say, okay, if you have someone who has, has symptoms of, of, uh, of menopause, and there are a lot of people who have very you know, troubling symptoms, that hormone therapy is okay, particularly women who are early in early menopause, so in their 50s, for example. Um, and so I, I think we're seeing the pendulum swing back and forth. The, then the, the question that, the other question, which there's even less data about, is long-term risks, really. We know what the benefits are. Long-term risks of, of gender-affirming hormone therapy in transgender folks. So uh, giving estradiol and anti-androgens to transgender women and giving testosterone to transgender men. And what they, they're effective in terms of trying to, to uh, have it be gender-affirming but we don't really know what the long-term effects are. Uh, so that's something that, that there is, that, you know, we, we, lo we like to have these randomized controlled trials where we can really have a strong evidence base so we can tell the patient in clinic, yeah, this is what the evidence shows, this is what we need to do. In transgender medicine, we just don't have that. Um, and so there's a big gap in, in knowing what's going on. Mm, yep, yep, yep. So that's something that we think about a lot. And in fact, we just started a study. Yep. So, w right. So we just started a study through the AIDS clinical trial group looking at transgender women um, starting or reinitiating hormone therapy with, with one of two different types of antiretroviral therapy to see if there is this interaction. Uh, to see if hormonal therapy decreases the levels of the drug in a sort of a dangerous way so that you would get lower levels and potentially break through virus. And to see if the, uh, conversely, whether or not the, the, uh, the drugs, the HIV drugs, impact the level of the hormone therapy. And so we just don't know that the, the, the data that we have isn't in, in uh, transgender populations. So this study just opened uh, last month. Uh, and we're recruiting, yeah. so that's another thing that, you know, people know, uh, you know, transgender gender women uh, who are either initiating uh, uh, hormone therapy or are willing to stop for two weeks and then restart. Uh, you know, we'd we, uh, love people, people to be on the study. Okay, sure. Two more questions right here. Sure, sure. Good question. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. So um, if you are going through menopause and you choose not to replace hormones, are you doing any damage? And the answer is probably not. Um, it's really um, trying to um, you know, decrease symptoms because some symptoms are, are, really, are really troublesome and really limiting. So we don't think that there's necessarily a, a bad effect, you know, although we know there's a lot of stuff that happens during, <laughs> during this menopausal transition. So we know that, that uh, cholesterol goes up we, and, and heart disease risk increases. We know that bone mineral density goes down and fracture re risk increases. And so there are other ways, as you know, we were 
we've been talking about other things that we can do to decrease the heart risk and to decrease the, uh, the fracture risk um, that aren't the hormonal therapy, but really the hormonal therapy is, 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 is for these symptoms, these um, estrogen deficiency symptoms like the, like the, the, hot, the hot flashes. Yep. So my bad cholesterol is high. Yep. So would you suggest like taking care of that situation with the medication or Yeah, yeah. So right. So the bad cholesterol being high, so what this tells us is you know, we have medication that can bring down the cholesterol, right? which is good, you know, bringing down LDL, but it's just a number, you know, bringing down LDL, it's really just a number. What you really wanna do is decrease your risk of heart attack in the next 30 years, right? But, and the nice thing we know about these, uh, these medications is that they do decrease, not only they bring down cholesterol, but they decrease the risk of heart attack and stroke. And so that's really the, the critical piece of information. And that we don't know about hormone replacement. We know hormone replacement improves symptoms but we don't know any, we, and we, we, there are some data suggest there's increased risk of cardiovascular disease. We don't, there was a lot of promise that they were gonna decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, but that wasn't shown. Sure. Yeah, hi, could you go back to the slide with the outstanding questions? Sure. There we go. So of this question, how far are we with any? Okay, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, so I have these sort of thought-provoking, I would hope would be thought-provoking questions, um, and how far are we with any of them, which is a really critical. Um, I think we're just at the beginning, actually, <laughs> to tell you the truth, to really understand um, how this. So the, I'll, the, the second bullet here is this, this population issue that I alluded to about you know, the tale of two patients, patient A and patient B. So we just don't have a lot of that patient B population. And it could be that, that what we're seeing with aging in HIV is only restricted to people who, who are, are, are long-term survivors. Um, and if you, if you catch HIV, uh, if you di diagnose it at an early stage, you know, CD4 cell count isn't all that low, get people on therapy right away, therapy is much less toxic than it was 30 years ago, then um, perhaps we won't see the same thing, but we just don't know that question, that, the answer to that question. Yeah, so the, the other, the mechanisms, you know, one of the things that, that has been really interesting is sort of pairing up with the, the gerontologists, the people who study aging, to try to figure out, okay, what do we know about aging in general? And then what do we know about, about people with HIV and, and aging on the molecular level? Like all these little mechanisms in the cells and in the DNA and the mitochondria, all these cell things. Um, so that's uh, ongoing. And ideally we wanna know, you know whether we need to intervene differently um, uh, on, on that population. So I said that I think the first bullet is very much in the early stage. The implementation science is something that's really important. It's something that the uh, NIH is really keen on, is trying to figure out, we know stuff that, that works. You know, say this reprieve study, we know that statins decrease the risk of, of heart attack in people at low risk of, of cardiovascular disease uh, who have HIV. So how do we get statins to the, to the population? How do we make it cheaper? How do we decrease the barrier? So the, those are, that's what this, the, so we'll see in the next five years, lots of implementation science studies and trying to help with that, with that, uh, that aspect of things, trying to implement things that we already know work into populations. And then the man, management strategies, we're still working on that. Um, so, so I think we're, we're making some progress, but I think that you know, there's a lot to be done as well. Some, yeah, <laughs> good question. Yeah, so HCTG, the AIDS clinical trial group. So the, um, you know, their, fo their focus is, has been on HIV treatment and not so much on the comorbidities. That although the ACTG was a big funder of Reprieve, you know, the study about a statin for cardiovascular disease. So there's, there's interest, but um, hopefully the NIH as a whole, and they have been, because you know, 13 institutes for across the NIH fund my study. You know, the, the, um, and so there's a lot of interest overall at the NIH, but, um, but in the usual HIV funding, you know, NIAID, um, they're moving away from these comorbidities. Great, sure.